Well, hello and welcome back to the Quality Matters Daily Dive brought to you by Texas Quality Assurance, where quality management gets simplified. Today, we are going to be answering all of life's questions and quandaries about quality managers and why they fail. Maybe, maybe not, but we're going to have fun talking about it one way or the other. Now, I have discussed this uh I think it's ironically named handbook, like you, you can barely hold it. But uh, really, if uh, if you can get your hands on it, it's actually kind of hard to do. I had to find this one on, on eBay. You can actually see, uh, you know, the white out from the school it used to belong to. I guess this was in a engineering department at one point in time. But this is Joseph Dran's Quality Control Handbook. Now, not the most uh, recent publication, but I got to tell you, I have yet to find anything in here that is outdated. The fact is that Duran and Deming were absolute visionaries and have yet to find that any of their ideas are, uh, are outdated as of yet. So in the quality control, ironically named handbook, we have a whole section in here on quality managers. Now, some really, really fascinating stuff in here that I won't go into, but so worth checking out, so worth purchasing. And again, since you're buying it on eBay, I think I got this sucker for like 20 bucks. I mean, the shipping probably costs more than the book. Um, but how to organize department, how plant managers, division managers, and how quality fits into the whole role. So really, really fascinating stuff. But... One of the things he talks about in here is why quality managers fail. And I think he is spot on with the reason. And the amazingly ironic thing is it's for all the reasons that we think we ought to succeed. So I, I'll kind of, you know, spare some of the uh, the suspense there. I know y'all are just dying to know. So let's get this shared up here. So just took a little snippet of the uh, the page I'm on in here working actually to get it set up so i've got a webcam on another book so i don't have to do this little snippet type stuff but hey we'll make it work so why quality managers fail let's zoom in here a little bit all right some fail for unrelated reasons to quality lack leadership poor skills poor rapport with peers hey i think we all get this um especially like think about it us quality managers are we typically the most outgoing people? Are we typically the most social, energetic folks? Um, I have had to learn to be this way. I am a hardcore closet geek. I mean, land parties in high school, you name it, that was me. I did everything but play Dungeons and Dragons. And I have had to learn to interact with people really well. So let's face it, that is a problem that a lot of us quality managers face. But if you can get past that, maybe we'll talk about some ways to do that in the future. There's a lot of really good reasons why we fail in our jobs beyond our own hindrances or lack of leadership and so forth. Unfortunately, that's kind of where it usually gets blamed. And there's there's a lot of other things that are directly in our control as quality managers that we can do to ensure our success. So don't neglect that, um, you know, just because I always love talking about books. So if you haven't read either, check out Jocko Wilnick's uh, Extreme Ownership. I know it's kind of become cliche these days, but really sit down and read it. And man, I swear you could pull some of this straight from the book. So why do we fail in our role as a quality manager? Well, I think Duran is spot on here. Preoccupation with conformance. Okay, so he says here, this is understandable that the plant or laboratory, just imagine your facility, whatever it is. However, at the division level, the emphasis should be on meeting the needs of the customers. So how often have we gotten tied up in paperwork because it has to be done this way and neglected? What does the customer actually need? You know, folks get confused sometimes when I talk about nonconformance reporting. And I say, look, do and accept as concession in there. Man, if there's a certain delivery date that has to be hit and this one number is slightly out of conformance, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I'm saying customer satisfaction it, it comes high in that priority list. Give them a call. Say, look, we're going to be delayed two weeks if we have to repair, remake this, or we're going to be too delayed two weeks because the supplier didn't send us exactly what we're looking for. Hey, we can ship it out to you tomorrow. But we've got this concession that you have to accept. I need that documentation. 
cool. Accept the concession. Let's roll forward. When we run into problems, let's see those problems as an opportunity to make a decision in Deming's terms, plan to check act and do study act. Let's study the situation and say, well, is getting 100% in conformance the right way to go? Is following the nitty gritty minutia of our procedure that sometimes nothing but a ball and chain holding us back? Is that the way to go? Or might we have to find another solution? Okay, so preoccupation with conformance. I'm not saying put a uh, emphasis on value there. I'm saying preoccupation with conformance can lead to delays and can lead to poor customer satisfaction. And if your customer ain't satisfied, your quality management system stinks and you're out of a job. So if maintaining conformance is getting in the way of achieving the ultimate goal, which is customer satisfaction, we got to rethink and revise some things. Um, we probably get called in here at Texas Quality Assurance probably two, three times a year to help out with a consultation, but we're not doing ground up consultation. We're actually coming in doing cleanup work from what another consultant or, or manager put in place. Oh my gosh, it, it sickens me. It absolutely sickens me to see how many companies are just absolutely handicapped by their procedures. I mean, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, but unfortunately it is. Um, so that preoccupation with the conformance can be a big, big issue. Don't let it become an obstacle to your success. All right. Emphasis on technology versus business. Now, I got to tell you, first glance, I read this, and I'm like a little insecure because we've got a software we've developed. We, we push technology day in and day out to do better at your quality management system. Heck, what am I doing right now, right? We're, we're live streaming, got the whole setup and gear going for it. Okay. Not saying technology is bad. But don't make the emphasis the technology. <sighs> We've run into this before. Someone has spent money on some equipment, some software, whatever it is, and like they are stuck. We're going to use it. We spent so many thousands, a million dollars, whatever it is on it. We're going to use it. <sighs> I get it. I get it. Um, but uh, if you've ever taken any accounting and economics classes, they're going to talk to you about a cost known as a sunk cost cost. Once that money is invested in it, if there is not a viable way to get an effective return off of it, it's a sunk cost. It's there. It happened. Move on, find a better solution. Okay. So here again, there is a difference due to level. The plant or laboratory is a technological facility, but the business or the division is a business. So this, for most of you guys listening here, this is kind of the same thing like what I'm talking about. Let's say you purchased a software. And it's just not working real well. It's taking way more time to implement than you expected. And how much more money you're going to spend getting it to work? How many delays you're going to have getting it to work? How much training time do you have to give your employees to get it to work? Every hour you're training someone, you are not earning revenue. So we got to make certain we we balance these and make the most of it. Same thing with uh, equipment. You know, say you purchased a uh, machine and it's just not really working for you. We have to, have to, have to be ready to make an executive decision to say that the continual focus on technology is not there. Uh, you know, I was listening to an old uh, Steve Jobs interview and, you know, someone was challenging him on stuff with open docs and whatnot and why he didn't use it. And I love his response. I'm horribly paraphrasing here, but he said, we have to start with the customer experience first and then work backwards into the technology. So often our, our teams, we start to focus on the technology and then work backwards to how can our technology provide value to our customers? Seems quite logical. But start on, on the other hand, what do our customers need that they either know or don't know about? Then let's work backwards and see if we can identify technology we need to purchase, develop, or utilize to solve their problems. Okay, so enough on the uh, technology spiel there. Emphasis on departmental goals. Probably going to ruffle a few feathers here. So every quality manager has departmental goals and should, of course, meet them. Okay. Makes sense. In addition, the quality manager is concerned with a broad function which impacts all departments. We know this. This is why the quality manager can't be the internal auditor because he's involved everywhere. All right. 
So the quality goal of the Ed Division and Corporation are much broader than those of the quality department. All right, see, these broader goals impose broader goal than quality manager. So we've talked about this so many times before, and they've, the ISO standard has taken this and internalized it a little bit when we talk about context of the organization. Now, that context of the organization can and oftentimes ought to be rolled down to the context of the department within the organization. So don't just think about the context of your organization within the greater market or industry, but your department. What's the context of your department within the functions of the organization? I mean, I think that's basically the definition of a system. So really think about are our specific goals supporting the business. Now, guess what? This one right here for the emphasis on departmental goals, does that not kind of mirror the preoccupation with conformance? I'm not saying conformance is bad, but I'm saying humans capable of human error, humans capable or not capable of predicting the future, future needs, obstacles, and requirements came up with these requirements. Let's follow that PDCA cycle again and say, hmm, is this working for us? Might we ought to revise it or make an exception? All right. Here's the last one we're going to talk about today is unfamiliarity with the culture. This is a big one, folks. This is really, really a big one. Now, I know you can't hardly do any podcast or live stream or anything these days without talking about culture. It's such an overused word and overused excuse these days. And oftentimes when people talk about culture, they really have no idea what they mean. So I'll give you a small example. Our team, we're hiring right now, I'm doing the last two interviews uh, for the next position this week. Hopefully it goes well. But one of the key things we're looking for is, will this person fit in with the culture of our business? All right. So Obviously, we don't take ourselves horribly seriously around here. I, I like to laugh and joke and have fun on these things. So if we've got someone that takes themselves horribly seriously here, um, the suit and tie type person, they're, they're not going to fit. Now, that's obviously a, a kind of a generic, almost cop out example. But you really have to think about it. What's the culture of our company? You know, do you want to bring in folks who are quick to act, make good decisions on their own? It's some organizations, it's kind of ours. Or do you have an organization with a very structured decentralized command so that, you know, this department can make these decisions, but they know the limitations and this one can know these, or are you much very more hierarchical? And I'm not saying, I'm not making any value judgments on these three methods, but they matter. And you have to identify what the culture is. And especially if you're a newcomer to the team, or if a uh, position I've been in before, I was a QHSC manager, the company changed hands twice while I was there. Um, new management teams, new everything. So the new management team comes in, they're instituting it their way. If I'm not ready to change and adapt and understand how they want things done, I'm, I'm having I'm having a hard time. So we got to think about that. So let's see what Duran says here. An obvious example is the case of a quality manager who moves from a defense-oriented industries to civilian goods and industries. Okay, so we're talking about like Department of Defense to you know commercial goods. Very different. Very, very different. Um, I, I got to tell you, um, we are in the process right now of getting set up for a uh, certain uh, Department of Defense cybersecurity requirements. And Oh, my gosh. The, the way that you have to manage uh, your systems there versus most clients we work with is just night and day. Now, because I've got a little bit of a security um, IT background we were already 90% there. But again, it's, it's a very different mentality and way of thinking. Um, so just kind of something to, uh, to ponder and think on. So let's see what else he says here. These are two very different worlds with very different cultures. The defense, defense world is uh, dominantly an extensive, complex array of mandated specifications and quality plans. You don't do nothing that ain't documented, and daggum, you don't do it in any way that ain't documented. It takes a lot of time and effort just to learn those plans, the lingo, how to use them, how to apply to them. Civilian world, on the other hand, has, you know, some mandated specifications and plans. Um, but we find that here there's, there's a lot more opportunity for individual decisions, document what you did versus what needs to be done. So in civilian world here, he's saying basically we spend more time in that act world than the plan world. Not saying one's better than the other, but they're very different. 
so um, it places great stress on the fitness for use as well as such parameters for cost and productivity. Well, I think we all know that uh, anything that's a government contract, the budgets go woo, way out of control real quick. Civilian world, mm, not always the same. We got to watch the dollar a little bit differently. So this means in your role, you have to keep these things in account. So quality managers that move from one culture to another are really in grave danger of failure if they can't grasp incredibly quickly um, these changes and differences in emphasis on the role. So here you go. If you want to know why you're going to fail as a quality manager, preoccupation with conformance, too much emphasis on the technology versus the business needs, keep customer satisfaction in mind at all times, overemphasis on those departmental goals kind of meets the preoccupation with conformance and you're unfamiliar with the culture of where you work in. So if you can get these four under control, guys, girls, y'all going to be doing great. Um, this is going to be a success, uh, successful implementation of the management system, successful jump start into a new job. So I hope you guys have found something here useful and helpful. As always, if you need to uh, reach out to me, feel free. You can call anytime, email. I love to talk to folks, love to talk about quality, help you out. We never bill for a phone call. So let me know, and I hope to hear from you guys soon.